This is Roy Kennedy, and this is Spaces Between, a podcast about bringing gamers closer together and getting to know people in the industry. Today, I have a special guest. It is Jerry Hawthorne of Mice and Mystics and Stuffed Fables and now Aftermath fame. He does game design at Plaid Hat Games. So here I am to introduce Jerry to the show. How's it going, Jerry? It's going great. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. So basically, this show is just a show about like talking about gamers and talking to to gamers and trying to get to know them a little bit better. Um, I've had Jerry on my old podcast several times before, and I don't know, I just really enjoy your games and your philosophy behind game design, so I thought it'd be really fun to have you here on Spaces Between and just, just have a little talk, heart-to-heart and talk about games and stuff. Awesome. I take it you're not really going for ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, no, no. I, I, think, I think you're underselling yourself. I think you're underselling yourself. <laughs> awesome. So it's I okay. guess one of the things – I just want to jump right into it because uh, one of the things that you've been working on a lot is like – I know one of your – you did several games before and you worked like freelance with different things. And one of your big hits that's kind of like been like an evergreen there at Plaid Hat is the whole Mice and Mystics thing with lots of story. But like I know we've talked about it on shows before, but I want to talk about it here about like – how important story is to you in game design? Sure. Well, I've I've um, <clears throat> I've never hidden from the fact that story mm-hmm. is like my main the, the main thing that I like in games. Mm-hmm. Um, I realize that it's you know it's different for different people, um, and and that's what's great about the gaming industry is we have a huge variety of games that provide all different kinds of entertainment for all, you know, all different tastes and stuff. But for me, it's always been about the story because I've always been trying to recapture those old days when I was young and I discovered Dungeons and Dragons Mm -hmm. and it was amazing and I loved those experiences and I always as an adult I've never been able to really engage with RPGs in the same way that I used to when I was a kid I never understood why but I I just I guess it's just you know the way that the imagination works and so what I want to do (laughs) well it's part I don't, I, it's it's hard to describe. It's like when you're mm-hmm. young, you know, being silly and, and and acting a role and stuff is easier, I think, sometimes than it is, or at least mm-hmm. for me, anyways, than uh, than it is when you're old. So I thought that, um, you know, I've always felt that like we could use more story in our modern day board games, especially fantasy adventure board games. Yeah, yeah. And that 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 story would sort of uh, sort of be a surrogate uh, replacement for those old. Dungeons and Dragons days when you were a kid and everything was just so magical and awesome. And, you know, when I was young, Dungeons and Dragons was young. And so mm-hmm. all of it was new. And um, so, yeah, I think that uh, I, I prefer board games in the way that they're structured, but I also want that story in there. So I've always been about trying to create that magical combination of board game mechanics uh, combined with some story. I just really love how, like, narrative in games can just really like bring the theme to life i mean there's so many games that are like okay you're doing this and that and you're moving pieces around the board but there's just something about like when that narrative gets laid out and kind of tells you what you're doing and what's happening or you like discover an event and this thing happens and this narrative emerges from the game um it i just feel like it just brings you into the game so much more yeah i mean it can like sort of bring the experience to life uh mm-hmm. in a way but that's not to take away from like the pleasure of moving shit around on oh. moving pieces around. I'm sorry, <laughs> see that's going to happen live. Uh, moving pieces around on the board um, and, and doing the mechanical things in a game can be very rewarding in itself. Oh yeah. Right? yeah. But um, and the experiences like can ha- can build their own emerging narrative, mm-hmm. you know, without having any uh, story provided for you by the by the author at all you could still build a narrative and that's those those are experiences mm-hmm. that are just uh, fantastic um but to like take it a step further and like you know create a create a game experience that's similar to like reading a book but like a mutual group thing that you're experiencing together i think that has its own place too and that can create an indelible experience which is really what we're all trying to do mm-hmm. is that uh, you know I noticed a lot of your like story games that you've made so far have like a almost like a moral lesson in them, whether it's like like growing up with stuff fables and things like that, like all oh, being scared of wetting the bed or like getting out of the crib or like first day of school sort of stuff. How, how important is like 
like putting the morals in the game to you? Well, it's um, it's not necessarily morals. I mean, there can be there can be lessons in a game mm-hmm. uh, in any kind of game that you can learn. I'm not trying to like deliver morals to people. I'm right, trying right. to deliver situations where their their morals were in, will interact with that situation gotcha. in interesting ways. But like when I go to write stories and when I when I think of stories that I want to tell, mm-hmm. there are always stories that have something to say. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> you know. Like they always have something to say. And I feel like without that, then I probably wouldn't be motivated to write the story. Right. Um, or there wouldn't be some sort of like need for it in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I don't really ever write stories that are just um, just slice of life stuff that yeah, yeah. Uh, has no consequence to it. It's going to have some sort of message or some sort of meaning or. Uh, something that that the players can figure out if they're discovering the story, they can figure out the nuances of it, um, and that's like sort of a mini game if you think about it. Mm-hmm. And it's like almost like stuff fables had sort of like discussion points, like that you play with your kids. Like I remember there was one event card where there was like that that my kids got when we were playing through the game. It was like an action figure or something like that that had broken its leg and it's like you had a choice of do you make fun of the action figure or do you do you help him out and like those and seeing how your kids interact with that sort of thing i think is super interesting as a parent like it when they're like oh well we're just gonna make fun of the the broken toy it's like you have a discussion and be like hey this is what happens when this happens. And just because people are different, just because people look different or, or are broken in certain ways doesn't mean that you can make fun of them and push them away. And hey, maybe maybe you need their help later on, you know? That sort of thing is a great discussion that these sort of games Ex- can give to your family. Exactly. I mean, you nailed it right there. Um, you present these, uh, these situations, basically. or mm-hmm. That's what I call them, situations. You present a situation to the audience, and then let them sort through it and everything. And uh, if it makes them think, or if it mm-hmm. ma- if it generates discussion, then that's where the magic happens, you know. I uh, like the one that that you're talking about. This, you know, it's just a simple card with a little with a little situation that you encounter, yeah. and then the way you deal with it is uh, that's that's the important part. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't that's have awesome. to like give them any more than that. You don't have to, you know, I don't have to lead anybody into it. They they experience the situation in their own organic way. That's awesome. Yeah, I know uh, back in the day when you used to talk about Mice and Mystics all the time, you talked about how you originally created the game to help your daughter with reading. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was like a super interesting story as well. Like that's like, oh, well, this game was like this whole story drive too was also built off of you like wanting to create stuff to, to help your family as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of naive of me at the time because it, the game never actually did help <laughs> like it never helped, helped anybody learn how to read, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, it might have helped people spark – it might spark a joy of reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also might uh, teach a different lesson than what I initially set out to teach. Um, when my daughter was struggling to learn how to read, I, as a dad, thought that I could fix it, right, because that's what we do. And um, so I started doing all this research. Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get in there. and I'm going to read all this stuff. And the things that I read about how to help children learn how to read are the things that I put into the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that really struck me, because my daughter, when I was trying to teach my daughter how to read, um, I would observe the way that she would act. And mm-hmm. um, we'd be laying in bed and I'd be, you know, it, it would come to her turn to read. And as she started to read, her leg would start twitching a lot. And she would get real twitchy and real restless and stuff, and um, and she would really struggle with reading. And and it was, it wasn't like the big words. The big words she would she would she was able to decode a little bit easier. It was the little sight words that were like mm-hmm. giving her a hard time. And those ones are supposed to be the easy ones that you just remember the sight words, right. and then your brain automatically registers them as you go along. But she was clearly having trouble with those. And it blew my mind. I was like, how come you don't know the word the? You just said it like two seconds ago. Yeah, and then now sure. you can't understand. What, I mean, literally, she would see the word the and she would say it. And then 
the word would appear again in the same sentence and she wouldn't know what it was. Yeah. Now, how does that happen, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm going through that right now with my son because my son is, is six years old, so he's right at that age. And exactly. So, so your, your son is at the same age my daughter was when we were going through this, right? So the, – and the, the reason is because she had a learning difference, and I'm not saying that your son does. Um, and I, I, have, I have no – I mean, I'm not a professional in this, in this field at all. Right, right. But in my daughter's case, the reason was because she had a visual processing disorder mm-hmm. that was linked – to her audio um, processing. So together they call that a sensory processing disorder. Um, And what happens is um, when she's trying to read, audio signals would come into her ears and every time like uh, her ear would have to process a sound, it would cause her to miss whatever information was there when she was reading it. So her eyes wouldn't track, it would blip every time. So the word the, her eyes would blip over the the, and she just wouldn't see it. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't get registered into her brain, it wouldn't get decoded, and it would cause mm. her to stumble in her reading because suddenly things didn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it was super challenging. Oh yeah. And I was reading about it, uh, about, I didn't even know that she had this problem at the time when I was making my submistics. I read about children struggling to learn how to read and the things that you could do to help them. And one of the things said, that if you break up the reading into small chunks and then put a little activity in between, do something, you know, whether it's patty cake or whatever, do something and then go back to the reading and then do something and then go back to the reading, especially if it's something that involves dexterity or balance. Oh, nice. the, <laughs> the reason that so, this so mice and mystic I, I know I'm like was going to be a dexterity game at first. Well, stacking mice. rolling dice, rolling dice will work and doing oh, math you. will work, right? Because what yeah, happens yeah. is that there's like a little, there's like a little. Uh, to, to oversimplify everything, there's a little filter in the brain that like sa- it sends inf- information this way or this way or this way, you know, and it'll switch back and forth. And when you have a processing disorder, that little filter is kind of a little bit messed up. And the way that you can help it is through doing something physical that requires a little bit of dexterity or balance. Mm-hmm. And then that, for some reason, calms that little filter down and allows them to concentrate a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So rolling dice or doing math skills, which are our opposite than reading skills, doing a little bit of math skills in between your reading, it supposedly helps. And so that's why I created Mice and Mystics, which is supposed to break up the little reading moments and provide a little activity to do that. And in my, in my mind, if that activity related to what you just read, then that would, that would enhance the experience. And so mm-hmm. that, was, that was what I did. That was what I started to do with Mice and Mystics. And so that's why when you're playing the game, it'll have story moments, you know, and you break away from the gameplay and you do a story moment, then you go back to the gameplay. And that's why it switches back and forth like that. So there you have it. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool how, like, games can be used. Like, I mean, basically every board game is in some way, shape, or form educational, whether it's, like, math or logic or, or reading or just all these different things. It's kind of funny. We did a... Uh, a teaching favorite game Friday the other day and Tom was just like every game's a teaching game like every game like you can be yes. taught something from every game I mean even yes. just the interactions with the other people around the table is is, yes. is teaching moments you know the thing the thing about games what's really cool about games is when you're learning you don't know that you're learning and mm-hmm. so sometimes games can be looked over they can be passed over as a learning tool but in fact they're probably one of the most effective learning tools mm-hmm. and that's that's either why smart people are attracted to board games or board games make smart people. I don't know which one it is, but <laughs> I think they go hand in hand. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, dumb people out there, but <laughs> board games have it. It's where it's at. <laughs> and I mean, I feel like there's any game that can be played on any level, you know? I mean, there's some games that are simpler. Yeah, I mean, I'm... you don't have to play the super heavy economic euro or whatever to be like, oh man, I'm so super smart and I'm doing this super huge spreadsheet. Like, that's not my jam. But uh, there's people out there that just rock that stuff. So uh, I know, and I'm I, I was trying to make a joke there and stuff and be funny. But you're right. I mean, you don't even have to. You know, the games can be as simple as rock, paper, and scissors. Like, mm-hmm. you don't even have to have physical components. Actually, you would have to have hands. <laughs> True. To play rock, paper, scissors. Maybe, well, there there could be a workaround there too, but. Um, there was this discussion that I think Eric Lang uh, brought up 
the other day on Facebook. It was all about, um, you know, if it, does a game have to be fun and does it have to be challenging? And if it isn't, is it really considered a game? And I think the discussion basically proved that there's a really, really, really a very broad interpretation of what constitutes a game, you know? Yeah. I mean, a game doesn't have to be challenging or fun. I just wouldn't want to play it if it was neither, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I think maybe you're, maybe you're right. I don't know. Uh, I don't... I'm actually interested in figuring out, like, what, you know, what what really what are what are what is out there that that could be considered a game that we haven't really tapped into yet you know um, there's definitely tons of different things and i mean that's the crazy thing is like th- this industry still has tons of innovation going on in it overall i mean you see all sorts of crazy games all sorts of different ideas i mean stuff that's even is like like done simple as like oh a storybook let's play the game on the book itself i mean that that's an awesome like thing in a game so, and I mean, there's so many other innovations out there in board gaming right now. Yeah, I mean, there's there's constant innovation happening. And what's really um, interesting about that is that, uh, and something I've discussed um, for about the past year, is that um, all game designers are working with the same basic set of mm-hmm. components. So you basically have a box with cardboard and plastic stuff inside, mm-hmm. right? And... Um, you know that you're we're all working with the same set of like components and we're all doing something different with the same set of ingredients and it's really kind of cool um then you see somebody like uh they'll they'll say hey why are we doing it this way and they they'll add an app in and then suddenly you have app integration into this and wow that's kind of cool you know mm-hmm. and then suddenly you know somebody will add uh something new like a different kind of component like you see with um, Azul, you know, where you have like these interesting little porcelain tile kind of things, you know, and they're not actually porcelain, but you know, they give you, you see that these, feel. yeah, they give you that feel. And all these little every every time somebody does something different that's tactile or you know pushes the edges of, of of what we know about board gaming or what we're what we're doing with these boxes that we all sell, it's really kind of cool. It's it's really super cool, and it's something that we should. I mean, I think in in the gaming industry, we all sort of support that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that just makes our industry that much more awesome and magical that we, there's this, you, this mutual support all throughout the industry of everybody who's doing anything that pushes the envelope and pushes the boundaries of what we do. How important do you think it is to try to like set your game apart as a game designer, like to try to make it be different than other things that are out there? Well, I think, I think right now, um, well, well, I mean, everybody should always try to make like a really good game, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, quality is is always paramount. But um, like right now in our industry, we have um, you know we have an enormous amount of 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 booming uh, action happening in our industry. So there are a lot of games being released, and so um, this creates a, a very very competitive environment. And so if you if you want to make a game and you want that game to be noticed in some way, then you're going to want to seek out some sort of new and different kind of experience for the players because, um, like there's a lot of veterans in this industry and this industry is really, the, the boom is young. The industry has been around for a long time, but the boom is really young. Right. But then the sheer number of games that all the veteran gamers and all the all the core hardcore gamers, the sheer volume of stuff that's coming at them, mm-hmm. and that they can't they can't afford to buy it all all of it and everything. Those people are craving something new, some sort of new kind of experience, right. you know. Um, some people are craving a new mechanical gizmo thing that they can figure out, and some people are craving a new uh, emotional experience that they can uh, that they can experience either a solo or with a group, and some people are are you know just looking for some you know something interesting and new and different that that they can just geek out on right Mm -hmm. so it's paramount that anybody who wants to get noticed in this environment to do something different you know to do something to offer something to these hungry uh people offer them something that they haven't tried yet or they haven't known yeah, as a as a consumer of board games, it's amazing because there's just so many 
good games. Like you can't play all of the good games. It's it's even hard to play all of the great games at this point. But as a designer on the other side of that, I feel like it's like, oh man, I have to figure out how to make my game not only great but also stand apart among all the other greats. You know? Yeah, there's pressure there too because like if you are thinking of an idea, chances are in this industry right now chances are you're not alone and so somebody mm-hmm. can beat you what would they call beating you to the market or whatever mm-hmm. they could beat you to the market with an idea and uh i'm not i mean i don't think anybody should be really worried about that but you also can't just sit on a cool, good idea you can't just sit on it and 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 camp on it that long you have to like mm-hmm. put action and people should put action into their ideas you know mm-hmm. i kind of like that i kind of like that how that pushes people to be like Oh man, I had this great idea. Well, you can't just sit and talk about that idea to your buddies over a beer and be like, "Wouldn't it be cool if we did this?" No, you you actually have to like you have to Develop do it, or somebody else it. will. Yeah, yeah. like That's uh, awesome. like like with Stuff Fables, you know, it, it, when I had the idea of doing a game with the theme of Stuff Fables, um, in my mind, I felt like it was going to happen, you know, whether I did it or somebody else did, it was going to happen. And so I better get on it, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the way I felt about my some mystics too. I was like, I can't believe there isn't an RPG adventure game where you get to play a mouse, Mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, with all the cool, you know, movies and, and books and stuff that have been devoted to that, I couldn't believe that it hadn't been done yet. And then when I thought, Oh man, I got to do this. I also thought, man, who else is going to beat me to the market with this? You know, yeah, yeah. Because it's an idea waiting to happen. Yeah. So, and like just the, the when you know the fandoms behind it, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm a fan of this sort of like media or this sort of thing, like this niche of fantasy. It's like nobody's made a thing in that yet. So, it's. Well, you, it could also be because nobody gives a crap about that. You know what I'm right, saying? Yeah, yeah. There's always that too, you know? Maybe nobody's done it because nobody wants it, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I wonder about stuff like that. Like, like okay, so, like, in Hollywood, right? Mm-hmm. Really, really, really cool movies. Really, really, really cool movies, they get started. They get really close to being, I mean, they get pre-production, I mean, which means a lot of money is already poured into this, and then they get canceled. And then when you find out about the movies that got canceled, you're like, why the heck did they cancel that? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a really good idea. Why did they cancel it? And you just don't know. Um, Maybe they decided it was too niche or something fell apart along the way. Exactly. But, but, you know, and then you're like, well, shoot, is my idea too niche as well? You know, Mm -hmm. like I've, I've had tons of ideas, like tons of ideas that I thought were really cool. I don't throw anything away. So I, you know, I document (laughs) all my ideas. I don't throw anything away, but I've had tons of ideas and every single idea I've had, I've thought, is this too niche? You know, is it like, are just, is this just something that maybe I like it, but like that, you know, is it like goat cheese where, you know, it's not, <laughs> not for everybody. Is it cilantro? I mean, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to create an idea that's going to be so limited that it's not going to resonate with that many people. Jerry Hawthorne making the goat cheese of board games. <laughs> Has there ever been one of those games that you've like, or one of those ideas you set off to the side and you like, you've stewed on it for a long time, like worked on something else and then come back to it. Yeah, I do that a lot with a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, is an example of something that, you know, I went back and forth on and, um, wrote stories for, and then, you know, created mechanics for and then dumped the mechanics and collaborated with other people on for years, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because I felt like it was an important, it was an important game that needed to be made an important yeah. message that needed to be told and an important story that needed to be experienced, uh, in a certain way. And, um, I just wasn't ready to tell it, I guess, until I was. And then, then, then I did. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so basically you had this story brewing and then finally you're like, well, this stuff fables thing went really well. So like, let's use that. Maybe. Well, it wasn't, it had, um, stuff fables doing I really mean, well. Um, uh, the, 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 the engine that I created that was used on stuff fables, mm-hmm. I also thought might work really well with, uh, so Coleman even, even other, before stuff fables was released, you already, in order to tell a story like Comanauts, I needed to have like this engine that would be yeah. 
flexible enough that you could tell a wide variety, have a wide variety of experiences being mm -hmm. uh, played by the characters, but also be um, uncomplicated enough so that the people that I wanted to deliver that message to wouldn't be turned off by heavy, complicated rules. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted it to be sort of simple and easy to play on your turn, and the turns would go quickly and stuff. And so that was the engine that I built to tell all these different variety of stories. That's awesome. I mean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Um, so, so several of your games use the whole storybook thing. Um, how did that sort of come about as far as like playing the game on a book and then reading the story as you go along, but then having the game change up as it goes along and stuff like that. I know you have several games that use that sort of system now. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to, um, hopefully I can keep on making games using that same system because mm -hmm. it really, it really is. It, it works with the way I design games because I mm -hmm. start with story first and then I build the game around it and it really works with the way I do things. And, um, uh, it's a, it's a great tool that provides me a lot of flexibility, but also constrains, you know, it, it reels me in because mm -hmm. I have a tendency to like, you know, woo. And, um, but with the way that the book thing came about is I wanted to, I wanted to create a game where the, the maps and all the different environments were in a spiral bound book and you could just flip mm -hmm. through them. And then all the story elements were in a separate spiral bound book that you could read. And I started talking to some friends about it and everything. And they said, well, have you tried any of, uh, you know, uh, you know, like above and below and near and far and these, these, uh, red Raven games, um, by Ryan Lockett. And, um, mm -hmm. I, and I hadn't, so I immediately like got, um, I think I got above and below first mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. This, so I saw that it can be done. And so yeah. I went to I went to my boss Colby, and I said I want to make this game, and I want to have the maps be in one book and the all the story bits be in the other book, and then you just you know you could pass the book around, but the 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 maps would be on this other book. And uh, he looked at me and he was like, "Why not just put them in one book?" Yeah, and I'm like, um, "Because that sucks and it's hard to do." <laughs> and you know, it, it, it creates limitations on the stories I can tell because it would, you know, I would be forced to tell that page, you know, that, that map, I would, I would be forced, everything that happens on that map, I would be forced to, you know, confine that into a 10 by 10 yeah, yeah. space. And, um, and he was like, well, that's the deal right there. That's like, if you can do that, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. And so um, he's like, that's what I would want to make. Because this is how my boss works. I go to Colby with an idea, and then he either gives me pushback or like, okay, this is okay, that sounds good. I would green light that if this is the way that you did it. So I went back. And to it's also board. one of those unique sort of things. It's like, hey, let's not necessarily do what somebody else is doing. Let's set exactly. it apart. Yeah. So um, I went back to the drawing board and I started to make this thing. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I had like I had already started making the other thing right so i had to like like i had to like reduce the story bits down and make it all fit and i i started to make it this this thing that was in a book and um i actually had colby made the um the template for me in indesign and so i started working in indesign with the template that colby made for me he's like okay this is how big do you want this thing to be and i told him 10 by 10 inches and then so he made this thing for me and uh so that i would know exactly what i had to work with Mm -hmm. what he what he envisioned and then i just started working within that those parameters and that's how it started it's crazy how you can just have this whole story unfold and it's all just like right there i feel like that helps with barrier of entry you know i mean once you get the basics down the rest of the things that unfold in the game are right there on the page that you're looking at right yeah and that's the whole that's the whole idea in a nutshell um and then we had never, I mean, obviously had never done this before with Stuff Able, so I just set off trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And then um, Stuff Able is very linear, so you start at the beginning of the book and you work your way through to the end of the book. Um, but with Comanots, um, mm -hmm. you don't do that. You hop around all over the place. Going from world to and, world. 
Yeah, and you're just uh, the the order in which you um, you encounter things is different depending upon your gaming group or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with aftermath, it's similar to Komonots in the sense that you hop around and stuff, mm-hmm. but um, it's more um, because you're it's mission based. Your mission will guide you through which pages you're going to. So even though you're not working through the book in a linear fashion like Stuff Fables, you're not really going freeform like Komonauts. You're sort of you're going structured through each mission. Mm-hmm. So, what do you? So think three different is, ways to experience the the book format so far. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys have tons more coming down. I do. I have I have a ton of ideas. I mean, I hope that I get to make all these ideas that I have because mm-hmm. I have some really really cool ideas on different things I can do with that book. And different ways that, I mean, different things that we can do with that book that, I mean, and I'm sure that, like, if other designers uh, made, Just know, imagine games, what sure you could do different- if the book was 11 by 11. <laughs> <laughs> one whole, in- yeah, I mean, sure. just one whole really, inch really, each really direction. Book. Why stop at 11 inches? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you only get a, a one inch each, each, each game you make goes up by one inch and by the yeah. time you're done it's just like giant atlas <laughs> like yeah blueprints. and if the game's not successful i lose an inch each time so <laughs> you know i'm like making these little itty bitty books that could be colby's like thing it's like hey listen you wanted to make a bigger game if the game does well you get an inch on the book and you lose an inch if you don't get, <laughs> get an inch on the book well imagine like having like um a small book that was really thick Mm-hmm. And tons of different locations, and That'd you had like crazy. little itty bitty, like little you know meeple sized miniatures moving in and around on there or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be all kinds of things. And then when you're done with it, it's actually a flip book, and you flip through, and it has animated things. <laughs> yeah, it animates everything. That'd be cool. <laughs> See, innovation. We're innovating right now. <laughs> I wanted to do a pop up uh, book uh, as part of like mm-hmm. stuff fables. I wanted to do like. The book, final boss scene, I wanted to have it be a pop-up book thing. Wow, you know? yeah, that'd be crazy. But, uh, you know, again, in a situation where Colby had to rein me in, and we don't know how to do <laughs> pop-up books. You know, <laughs> you know how expensive that's going to be? <laughs> we have to actually find somebody, you know, who knows how to do pop-up books. And <laughs> It's a pop-up. <laughs> that'd be so, cool, though. So how important is, like barrier of entry in games when you're designing games do you like do you guys think a lot about like how can we make these games more accessible to people it's hugely important to Mm -hmm. us um like i know colby considers rule books to be a uh they're they're a barrier that Mm -hmm. uh, people have to overcome that barrier in order to play your game so they're actually an obstacle Mm -hmm. and um the bigger and more uh chunky and more intense a rule book is uh the more difficult it is for oh, for, sure. um, for people to to overcome and um, that's not to say it's a it's a it's a deal breaker in the industry because i know there's a lot of a lot of popular and successful games out there with really really big and very complex rule books and stuff mm-hmm. but that that's just not the way that's not the way I want the actual gameplay to be in my games, although mm-hmm. I have a tendency to like, you know, put in more and more stuff, which is probably not the most elegant way to design. One of the problems with Mice and Mystics is that it had like a, I think it, uh, the rules took up like 27 pages or something like that. Yeah. For Mice and Mystics, it's like a family game, <laughs> you know, like a yeah, family yeah. game with a 27 page rule book. So somebody in that family, let's say I just, I designed this for a family to play. Mm-hmm. Somebody in that family had to like, you know, they had to like study that rule book and like decode how to play the game. And, um, like that just doesn't jive with like what my goal was with my mystics, even though it's, you know, it's a, a, you know, classic now and it's Mm -hmm. evergreen and all that business. It's still, it still bothers me that, um, it has a 27 page rule book for like, I could make that rule book now in half the amount of size you know what I'm saying? I mean, I could make the same game with half the amount of rule book that you have to get through. And that really bothers me because, like, I can't imagine how many people bought that game and never played it or how many people decided not to ever try to play that game because of the intimidation factor of that rule book. And that's just wrong, yeah. especially when I'm making a game for that I intend for families to play. Um, so what I, what I would like to do, and I think 
like my main goal is to eliminate rule books altogether. So yeah. <laughs> I'll never I'll never achieve that goal, but I think that's a good goal. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to be able to have the game be so easy to learn that it sort of teaches itself. And um, and you know I'm sorry for all the people who really really dig on the all the complexities and mm-hmm. you know uh, complex interactions and all that stuff. Uh, that's just not what I do, you know, yeah. and I'm I mean, hoping there's different I'm building up everything. Re- sure. Uh, hopefully I'm building up a reputation as being the dude that, you know, don't go to my games if that's what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. But I still have a lot of content in my games and a lot of stuff going on. So, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, it doesn't mean that an experience of playing my game is going to be void of, you know, of interesting interactions and choices and stuff. It's just that I don't want any of those to be hard to understand or difficult to remember. I think remembering is the biggest thing. If you go six weeks without playing my game and you sit down, you open it up and you want to play again, I don't want you to have to relearn the game. You know what I'm saying? I want those everything to be simple enough to remember, oh, yeah, this is all we do. This is what I do on my turn. I pull, you know, I draw pull some dice, dice out of the bag. bag and then, you know, yeah, just pull dice out of the bag and then play the dice. If you and get to me, the black ones, the monsters activate. There you go. There you go. That's what I want it to be. That's awesome. And I'll probably for the rest of my career, as long as, um, you know, as as many months or years or whatever that I'm given to work in this career, mm-hmm. I'll probably always strive for reducing the amount of rules overhead that you have to remember or learn. And that's what another thing about the adventure book games is having them share DNA from one to the next allows me to hopefully get like a little following and then they could play one game and then when they play the next they kind of know how it they plays already know a little exactly bit. how it is right yeah there's a little tempo a little rhythm if you're used to my games you know they're oh yeah we're gonna break and tell a little bit of the story here we're gonna play a little bit of game we're gonna do this so i like you know i don't like i don't like the players to ever know when the monsters are going to activate i like that to be sort of random so that they get to take their turn sometimes their turn comes by really fast oh man the monsters get to go again already Sometimes, you know, it's like, dang, them monsters are, like, lazy, you know? I, I like remember I, I remember the very first time I played uh, Stuffed Fables with my son, Scotty, and, and my daughter, Violet. And, like, for one, he was just terrified of the little crab head dude things. And uh, I don't know why that's the very first mission, but <laughs> kids are like, ah! But, yeah, that's uh, so funny. But he you was, know, I, he got was, the idea, I got the idea for that creature. Mm-hmm. off the internet there's actually there is like a video of a real hermit crab who made its home in a, a plastic doll head yeah that's that's pretty creepy <laughs> well I, I didn't even think it was that creepy i just thought it was so interesting you know that oh, yeah. instead of choosing like some normal thing to make his little home in he made it in a little in a little doll head and i thought that would make a great creature for but yeah for we a were game playing about, no. we were playing the first round and uh and I was like, okay, well, uh, I, it was probably my fault because I was building up the tension too much. I was like, if we pull another black die, then the monsters are going to activate, and then they're going to come and attack us. So don't pull a black die. And he pulls a black die out of the bag, and he <laughs> runs out of the room screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry Hawthorne, terrifying children. Oh, my so, gosh, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but it was fun. He came back, and we played the game. We defeated him, and it was, it was good times. But uh, I, I still thought it was funny. You know, overcoming fear is a big part of mm-hmm. – uh, of the lessons of stuff fables and a big part of the challenge of making stuff fables because, um, we had countless me and, um, uh, bistro, you know, the, the guy that's my co-writer, um, who is the, the staff writer for uh, Platinum games. Mm-hmm. We had countless discussions about the need to, the need for children to experience thrill and the, you know, and, and, and a little bit of scary stuff, you know, mm-hmm. And, like, sometimes we would go back and forth on it, you know? I'm like, okay, so, you know, I, I would sing a Christmas song that, you know, uh, they would talk about ghost stories, you know, mm-hmm. and Christmas, you know, like, there's Christmas songs that refer to people telling ghost stories on Christmas Eve, you know? Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, you do have ghost stories on Christmas Eve. You have the ghost of Christmas past. You have the ghost mm-hmm. of Christmas future, you know? Like, you have, like, this tradition of scary stories that children love and they love that thrill and they love all that. And so there's a, there's an importance in life to learning how to overcome fear. 
Mm-hmm. And that was a big part of, of Stuff Fables is to try to be uh, sensitive to that, but also not shy away from being a little bit thrilling, a little scary here and there. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think we did. I think we did good. I think we hit a good note on that because nothing is ever truly super scary in it. Yeah. You know, how can you learn to be brave if you don't have like chances to be scary, right? Or be scary, yeah. you know? Well, and you know, just the understanding that. I mean, as as flower as we want to make our lives for our children, that's a natural mm-hmm. parental habit. the The reality is is it's our job to prepare our children for the realities of the world, um, even when they're young, because unfortunately, you know, it's a scary, dangerous world, and um, the 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 earlier that you learn to adapt and mm-hmm. survive, and you know and take caution and stuff. These are the lessons that you learn through stories and through interactions and through being able to discuss those afterwards, Mm -hmm. especially in a safe environment like Stuff Fables. So uh, in a complete left turn, how did you yourself get into gaming? Well, I think I probably got into gaming because my, uh, my older brother, Mm um, who, um, he, he was, um, a really, really, He had a genius level IQ, and he was all mm-hmm. into like really, really, really heavy war games and um, like the hex and chit war games and stuff. Oh, dang. Um, and he w- always wanted somebody to play these games with, so he would always rope me into being the guy on the other side of the table that he would play against when he was playing mm-hmm. his complex games, and he would teach them to me. And he would handle all the, you know, all the setting up and everything, but I was, you know, the guy that he that he would sit on the other side of the table, and I learned all these games at, at a young age, um, games like you know Squad Leader and Crescendo of Doom and Blitzkrieg and Starfleet Battles, and you know all these games that I played with my older brother. We played. Oh, I can't even remember the name of this game. It was a, uh, it was, jet fighter combat air combat game Mm -hmm. that we played. I can't even remember the name of it, but the thing was so damn complicated. And my older brother, uh, of course, you know, he, he knew all of that stuff, but, but the experience of playing and like idolizing my older brother and being, looking up to him and super, super, super smart Mm -hmm. guy. And, um, and that the fact that he wanted to spend time with me and I was so much younger than him, it just had an indelible uh, impact on me. And then when my brother left and joined the air force, um, I really missed that a lot. And so um, I started trying to get games and play them with my younger brother, but I wasn't nearly as intellectual as my older brother. And um, so what worked for me is to find adventure games. So I got my myself and my younger brother, we got all into D&D and stuff and started playing Dungeons and Dragons. We played it regularly with kids yeah. in the neighborhood and we had we would get in my basement and we would have long, like six, eight hour long D and D sessions and stuff. And that was where, um, where I really started to become a tinker because I made, I literally made because I love star Wars and stuff. I literally made a science fiction version of Dungeons and Dragons for us to play prior to, you know, the star frontiers or whatever. (laughs) What was the name of the one that came out with? Is that the name of it? Um, I had it. I, uh, I know there were several different ones. I know I, I'm probably not like there's probably ones that even came out before, but I know Wizards of the Coast had one for a while. But then now Fantasy Flight has the Star Wars. But yeah, I mean, this is before any Star Wars RPGs or anything. Oh, around. Gotcha. We just I just I know made it was like stuff Meta- Metamorphosis Alpha or something like that had like space <laughs> stuff going on in it. <laughs> it was probably crappy, but, um, you know. We did it. We played. We played Dungeons and Dragons in space, kind mm-hmm. of thing, you know, and um, which is close enough to uh, Star Wars, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, stuff like that. Just tinkering around. I mean, in fact, I got like heavily into tinkering. I would, I just would not stop messing around with the different um, games that I that that mm-hmm. I had, you know. Do you think and, being um, a, a a DM or like game mastering games like? led into your like love for game design itself i think it, i think it did and i think it can i think when you when you're when you take on the the mantle of a dungeon master mm-hmm. you have to create a bunch of stuff and those mm-hmm. things that you create have to 
sort of fit in with the with the rules guidelines of of the of the RPG system that you're working with, and um, I think that that those are the skills that like sort of. I mean, if, the longer you do it, the more you become adept at it, and um, mm-hmm. that. I mean, I did D and D a whole bunch, and then you know I got into high school, I started chasing girls, and you know, sort of less and less uh, would we ever get together and do D and D. But then I took off and joined the military, and so I was in the military for four years with the Mar- with the Marines, and nobody ever. I mean, I never played anything while I was in the military. It was all about being mm-hmm. in the military and. Um, after I got out, I, um, came back to the United States and I, uh, I moved to a college town and, um, I met a girl there and we had the, this, this really active social life and I still wasn't playing any games at all, but I still like craved them. I would read about them and stuff. And then, um, I was, uh, I didn't have a car at the time. I was walking home from work and there's a game store that I kept passing, you know, on my way home from work. And so I popped in there one day and I started talking and I was like, yeah, yeah I like to paint miniatures. I used to play D and D and stuff. And the guy's like, well, do you still do any of that? I was like, Oh no, I don't have any miniatures. I don't have any paints and I don't have enough money to afford to replace all the miniatures I used to have. And he's like, well, here's a good deal. And he, he got me to buy hero quest and I bought hero quest, which they sold at, you know, target and Walmart or whatever. But I bought hero quest literally at a game store on this guy's recommendation, he said it has a tons of miniatures in it and everything, and it'll get you right back into it and stuff. And so I was, I just became like a huge, huge fan of hero quest. I mean, I was just, blown just away. Just imagine. I couldn't if, believe if that dude never recommended you hero quest, we wouldn't have mice and mystics and all these other awesome right. that story dude's games a hero. right now. That, he's a hero. <laughs> I mean, but think about it though, for, for a guy like me who mm-hmm. loved Dungeons and Dragons, and who had been divorced from it for years mm-hmm. and then just to discover that somebody had made a board game version of Dungeons and Dragons with all like great components and all this awesome components. You buy this tons of plastic for, terrain, you know, 30 bucks. And it's like this bomb, you know, boom, mm-hmm. you got all the miniatures you need for all this stuff. And I was, I, I really was a kid again when I bought that. And so that, um, I actually, uh, my girlfriend at the time would have killed me if I had brought that game home and, you know, and she knew that I just wasted my money on, you know, on, you know, on this frivolous thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So, but I wanted those miniatures so bad. So I, I opened up the box on my way home from work. I opened up the box. I took out the sprues of miniatures and the rule book, I think. And I just pitched the box and all the cardboard into the dumpster. Right. Now, people are going to get out their pitchforks and stuff, and, <laughs> you know, because that's like sacrilege, right? And I, I literally hid the miniatures because I wanted them so bad. I hid the miniatures. And um, yeah, anyways, I, I started reading the rule book for, for HeroQuest, and I fell in love with the rules. I mean, they were just like, okay, you could do anything pretty much that you did in Dungeons & Dragons, but all in like a very mm-hmm. concise board game version, right? So I knew I had to have the game. So I went and I re- literally repurchased um, the game so I could have all that stuff. But I ended up with like double the amount of miniatures. Gotcha. And that was how I ended up with uh, with, with Hero Quest. And the after best that, we thing about Hero together. Quest. Yeah. We started getting together on Friday nights. Um, I got my girlfriend into it. I got all of our friends into it. So, on so Friday at night, first you were ashamed to talk about the Hero Quest. But then you're like, no, no, let's all play the Hero Quest. I hate Oddly enough, I convinced all these Mm non-gamers to play this game. I taught them how to play it. They fell in love with it because it's easy to teach. And I would guide them through these adventures. I got to play the DM just like (laughs) Mm -hmm. back in, you know, when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I got to play Zargon and I was like running them through all the quests in the quest book. And we were eating that stuff up and we Mm -hmm. would get together and we're talking, we're in our twenties. We're like going partying every Mm -hmm. Friday night. We're out in the clubs, out of the clubs, out partying and stuff. But before, everybody would show up at my house and we would play HeroQuest before we went out on the town and went and did our normal 20-something stuff. And that was some of the best times of my life spent doing that. So that was like really where it all happened. I started writing our own adventures. I started creating – I had to create you know, new characters because there, no, there was no cleric. You've got to have a cleric, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, there was no thief. you got to have a thief, you know. And, um, and then I would like – I would – 
you know, some some of our players would, you know, have different personalities, so I'd always create a character for them mm-hmm. and stuff and new adventures, new monsters, and, you know, just the works. Just making all kinds of stuff. It was fun. That's awesome. But that's where the passion, that's where the passion hit me. And then it hasn't left since because I've been tinkering with games and making games and, you know, constantly doing this stuff since then. So That's interesting. I wonder if a lot of people have that story of, like, playing games when they were a kid a lot and then just those teenage years hit you, you know. I mean, I had, like, the same thing. There was a lot, like, I played a ton of games when I was younger and then when I hit around that age of, like, like 16, 18-ish and like growing older from there, I like there was a, a stunt where I just didn't really play many games at all. I was focusing on doing music and playing in a band yeah. and all that sort of stuff as opposed yeah. to like playing games. And then I started playing like some friends at work were like, hey, you want to play this thing called D&D? I had played tons of role-playing games growing up with my dad. We played Game World, but I never actually mm. played actual D&D. So when they were like, oh, want to come over and play D&D? I'm like, ah. Because my parents were sort of conservative, so they were kind of like, oh, the D&D oh, really? thing. <laughs> so uh, I had actually, with my friend, we had tried to make our own, like we wanted to make Gamma World, which was the role-playing game we were playing, but we wanted to make it like fantasy, like Lord of the Rings. So we were, we were, we were like backwards engineering <laughs> our own D&D. What the heck? <laughs> and we didn't know d and like we had heard the name D&D, but we didn't know what it actually was. Anyway, so... We, interesting, you were back. Backwards engineering from Gamma World back to fantasy. Yeah, yeah. We, we, from I literally, I actually found pieces of paper where I had written out like dagger one b four, like <laughs> like broadsword one b six, just because yeah. these were things like from Gamma World and from like I played Zelda and a lot of like yeah. Final Fantasy and things like that. It's like why does no one have a role playing game that's like fantasy characters? Yeah, I was so Who naive. How funny, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, but then I got back into playing D and D and did magic, and then I found Battlestar Galactica and fantasy flight games and board games, and it just went from there, you know. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Hey, you know the, the funny thing about D and D, the way I discovered D and D is I had a friend mm-hmm. um, in how, whatever grade that was, young. I had a friend who um, he was a his he had a single mom. He was being raised by a single mom, and she had a boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Who had the game Chainmail, and like like the little the little book Dungeons and Dragons stuff, mm-hmm. and um, and my my friend got to play that with with his uh, uncle because mm-hmm. he always had a lot of uncles, um, <laughs> and so he got to play that game and he really liked it. So mm-hmm. his uncle bought him the old blue box set of D and D. Now that predates the red box set. That's the nice. one that came with the crayons that you would color in the, mm-hmm. the dice and stuff. That's that really, in my opinion, that was just such a great product because, mm-hmm. um, it came with, um, I think the name of the adventure was like descent into the unknown or something like that mm-hmm. was the, was the, the adventure module that came with that. And it was also a dungeons dungeon master instruction tool where it had you had to fill in the blanks um, in it. Mm-hmm. It had the whole adventure in there, but you had to fill in the blanks of the creatures and the and the treasure and stuff. Oh, so you could and name taught, everything. Yeah, and it taught you how to do that, you know, and it gave you some guidelines for how to do that. And this is like in the basic, you know, the basic blue box mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons. But that adventure is really quite good. And I believe the mini adventure that's actually in the rule book, the little mini adventure mm-hmm. is really, really a good little itty bitty mini adventure too. That's awesome. I can't remember the name of that one, but, um, but it's really kind of, kind of a neat little introductory it's, adventure. It's crazy. Like to where like board gaming and role playing games are at this point. Cause I remember like back in the day when we played it, like we had to go to like this niche game store, like back in the very corner of a mall. And like they uh-huh. had some like polyhedral dice and stuff back there it's like oh we get that to play gamma world and stuff with my dad growing up i remember having like a yellow set of dice it's like because they didn't have a whole lot of color choices back then you know <laughs> yeah, um now they have every color under the sun um and all sorts of crazy dice all over the place but now like um i was in target the other day and they have like multiple like box sets of D and they're selling like just sets of polyhedral dice like they're in the in the kids section where the board games and stuff are I'm like, holy smokes, like, they have huge selection of board games, like all this D&D stuff. And I'm like, man, it's crazy how much this stuff has grown. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you imagine like 
the feeling that I had when I was in my 40s mm-hmm. and I got hired by uh, Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast, mm-hmm. to do the Dungeons and Dragons version of Heroescape. Yeah. Like, that was, like, weird. I mean, talk it's about... It's funny because I remember when I worked at Target and I saw that on the shelf and I was like, holy smokes, <laughs> this is a and d thing here. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that was a mind-blowing experience to go all the way, to travel all the way from... You know, my childhood and playing D and D all the way to actually being, you know, working on this. It wasn't as um, interesting actually doing the work, but you know, we did, we had so many. We we didn't we, we didn't have as much creative like licenses as, as you would want to have because mm-hmm. they wanted specifically this, 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 and this, and we give us a stat you know. block. Yeah, I mean, yeah, basically, and then I mean, we we were to create the 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 hero escape version of those characters but we had to you know we had to do a black dragon and this is the name of the black dragon and this is what we want it to do and then we would make the hero escape version of that we didn't really get to choose or anything mm-hmm. not complaining in any way i'm just oh, saying yeah. we, it wasn't like it was free form and we were able to f- pick and choose what we put in there when when you design that sort of thing i know hero escape was very much like points for like your different armies and things like that did they have like uh-huh. the math behind like the points for like movement stats and different things like that, or did y'all have to just feel what you thought was right? Well, there's sort of a um, there's sort of a mythology behind all this because the um, back when HeroScape first came out, everybody was like, oh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. there must be a matrix, you know, a points matrix behind this that um, the designers are using, and the designers had actually hinted around at having one. They had like, you know, dropped a few hints here and there. Mm-hmm. And remember, this is really before social media took off. So oh, yeah. we're talking about old old school days. And um, so it became. You're talking about on MySpace. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's about the time that MySpace was around. <laughs> we we actually had a forum that um, Colby and I um, uh, we we ran this forum that was a, a fan forum back when people used to use forums. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a fan forum for. Um, for hero hero escape but yeah anyways is everybody assumed that the that the designers had like this points matrix that they would go by and uh come to find out they kind of did have a little bit of a formula but um it really wasn't it didn't it, it it really was just a set of guidelines and it didn't really cover everything because really the the heart of hero escape is all about the abilities that each character has Mm-hmm. And um, the stats become secondary, and those were easy. You know, if a, if a character was just stats, you could really point that out. But right. um, but the abilities are what really kind of throw it off and stuff. So um, there have been players that um, you know, fans of the game who have created you know uh, matrix for for pointing stuff up, and they can get it within a ballpark and everything. But still, at some point, you have to look at that ability and say, how influential is this ability on the game? And how many points would I actually buy that ability for? And that's kind of how uh, we did it, is like, what would you pay for this ability kind of thing? Would you pay 10 points for that ability? Hell yeah, that's a bargain. <laughs> would you pay 20 points for it? Yeah, I'd still pay 20 points for it. Okay, what if you had to pay 30 points for it? Yeah, you know, so right. that's pretty much how we did it. And and when you're playing the game, or when it, when you're, because I know y'all did a lot of tournaments and stuff, and it's like, oh, which which character is the character that is low point costed for what they do? You know, it's like, oh yeah, man, they got always... these amazing stats and this amazing ability for this many points. So. Yeah, and there's there's always um, there's always you know um, units like that, and there were some that were you know functionally uh, didn't really work for tournament play because. When you get into tournament play, you get into this different mindset where the players are uh, less interested in thematic, you know, armies and stuff, and they're more interested in what works and what's going to win them the tournament. Oh yeah, for sure. And is you know, you might be one of those people that says that that's wrong. Um, I'm not one of those people that says that's wrong. That might break the spirit of the game, but mm-hmm. the spirit of a tournament is to win, and you can't you can't fault these people for like trying to do what they're going to do to win. Right. So you'd have units that you design to be fun to play. But when used by somebody with a tournament mindset, they don't really work very well. And those, those really created a problem for us when we were trying to run tournaments, you know. Because people would, they would spend the money to have multiple and, you know, quadruple copies of that unit. And then they would just, you know, 
they would span that unit and, and end up dominating the, the the tournaments. Awesome. Well, it looks like we're rounding out the end of our hour. Um, could you tell us a little bit, Jerry, about like what you're working on and what people should be checking out coming out from you soon? Um, Aftermath comes out at the end of the month, at the, at the end of September here. Um, Battlelands, um, which is a card game that I was a developer on, but mm-hmm. I really love because it's set in the Aftermath world. It comes out next week. Oh, nice. Um, I We have a couple of expansions um, planned. We have several expansions planned for Aftermath, and those will be coming you know, in the near future. I'm also working on um, an expansion for a bigger box expansion for one of the other adventure book games. And (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm working on a bigger box expansion for Aftermath and also working on stuff past that too that is in the conceptual phase right now um, that involves my semistics. So... Awesome. Well, tons of amazing stuff coming out from uh, Jerry. And I'm sure if anybody wants to check out y'all's stuff, you can go to uh, plaidhatgames.com and hit you up on Twitter. It's at mice guy, right? Um, mice underscore guy. Mice underscore guy. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much <laughs> for coming on the show, man. It's definitely been a blast having you on. Um, we Thank stream, you. We stream these live. Um, Mm -hmm. on the Dice Tower Facebook group. Make sure to check those out live, and then we put it up on the YouTube channel the week after. So if you're watching this on the YouTube channel for the Dice Tower, make sure to join the Dice Tower group and come and check out the next show live, which is uh, with Brian Drake. He's one of our contributors here at the Dice Tower. Thanks so much for coming on, Jerry. It's definitely been awesome talking with you, and it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.